Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of the Human Physiology video tutorials with me Dr. Amir Sandhu. Now today we're going to talk about how Endo the endothelium can release nitric oxide to cause vasodilatation. Okay, so if we think about uh, our coronary arteries, they've obviously got to dilate to increase blood flow to the myocardium. Now what we're going to do is look at the cellular process in terms of what's happening. Now just before we start, this here is an endothelial cell. Okay, so I'll put that down here, endothelial cell. And this kind of um, uh, tear-shaped um, uh, object here, or drawing here, is a smooth muscle cell, okay? So remember, this is the middle part of the blood vessel, uh, which is located in the media of the vessel, and this, the endothelial cell, is the innermost layer of the blood vessel located on the intermal lining. Now, let's break it down to the basics. In order for us to get uh, an increase in nitric oxide, we need to increase the amount of calcium within the endothelial cell because as we'll see in just a moment, the calcium is extremely important to actually get uh, uh, activation of endothelial nitric oxide synth synthase, which is a gene involved in the production of nitric oxide. Now, we know that in, inside the blood vessel, we've got blood flowing in a laminar uh, direction. So we've got parallel, laminar basically means parallel blood flow to a particular structure. So we've got blood flowing in parallel to the vessel wall. Now that blood is carrying agonists of nitric oxide, such as acetylcholine, so ACH. The bradykinin uh, is also a nitric oxide agonist, as well as adenosine triphosphate, uh, ADP, adenosine uh, diphosphate, uh, and substance P, and there are many other nitric agonists which have specific receptors located on the surface of the endothelial cell, uh, and when uh, acetylcholine binds to the particular receptor, so it would be a muscarinic receptor, would be the type of receptor, uh, that would cause the endoplasmic reticulum, which we've got here, to increase the amount of calcium and then we would start to get the chain of events which lead to the production of nitric oxide. Okay, so that's one way in which we're uh, increasing the, the calcium. Now, the endoplasmic reticulum is like the, the store of calcium within the endothelial cell. And the idea is that once these receptors are stimulated by the agonists, they act upon the endoplasmic reticulum, increase calcium. The calcium will then change the conformation of this protein here called calmodulin. Now, the conformation of that protein will change, allowing ENOS, endothelial nitric oxide synthase, to bind to the calmodulin. Now, normally, in a, in a blood vessel which is not dilated, ENOS is located on little invaginations in the cell membrane. Okay, so we can imagine small little uh, in, invaginations here, which would house the ENOS. Okay, those invaginations are called cavioli. Okay, the, and ENOS is actually bound to a protein called caviolin. Okay, so by increasing the calcium levels and changing the conformation shape of calmodulin, you start to get enos detaching, okay, the calcium causes the enos to detach from the caviolin, attached to the calmodulin, and then you have precursors which are necessary to produce nitric oxide, and um, amongst the most important precursor is the protein L-arginine, okay, so L-arginine is a protein which is converted in the presence of other cofactors such as BH4 or tetrahydrobiopterin, into nitric oxide. Okay, so that's in its simplest form how nitric oxide is produced by the endothelial cells. Increased calcium, which allows the enos to detach from the uh, cavioli, to uh, binds with the calmodulin, and you get the conversion of l arginine into nitric oxide. Now, when the endoplasmic reticulum runs out of calcium, which can happen when you want prolonged vasodilation, so you have a continuous stimulus for the blood vessel or the coronary vessel to dilate, the endoplasmic reticulum may run out of calcium, and there's two things that can happen in that situation. The first is soaker or store-operated calcium channels uh, come into play, okay? Now, when the endoplasmic reticulum runs out of calcium, it sends a, at the so far, unidentified signal to the store-operated calcium channel, which then takes extracellular calcium, okay? So, um, extracellular, we can just fit this onto here, and hopefully you can read it. Extracellular calcium then comes into the cell, 
and increases the calcium levels and then you get that reaction as, as explained earlier. Now, one other thing which is extremely important for maintaining um, enough calcium within, within the vessel is the impact of shear stress. Okay, now shear stress is the dragging frictional force on the endothelium. So as the blood flows parallel to uh, the blood vessel to the endothelium, it's exerting a dragging frictional force Okay, against the um, uh, against the endothelium, like when water goes through a pipe, the, the water is actually exerting a force on the the inside of the pipe. Now, what shear stress does is it activates calcium uh, activated potassium channel. Okay, now this what this channel does is it allows the potassium which is contained within the endothelial cell to move outward. So it, it has a, a net efflux out of the cell and it allows calcium to come in or influx into the cell. So that increases the calcium, which as we then know, goes across into the equation and, uh, and then the, the reaction continues as, as normal. So that is exactly what's happening uh, in, in that respect. There is one other uh, mechanism as well, which is important. Now, the, the shear stress also causes phosphorylation as well. So when we've completely run out of calcium, we can actually have phosphorylation Phos, for, re, and I'll continue that here, lation. We can have phosphorylation of enos, which basically activates various protein kinases, protein kinase A, protein kinase B, which uh, allow uh, enos to increase its expression within the endothelial cell and then continue with that reaction as well. Now, generally what happens with um, calcium activity, when you have a short-term increase in the dilation of the blood vessel, it's normally the calcium that's responsible for that. For prolonged vasodilation, it's when the calcium is reduced, it's the phosphorylation that comes into play. Now, the next thing that's extremely important is to think about what happens to the nitric oxide uh, to cause vasodilation. Well, it must be released out of the endothelial cell and it must enter into the smooth muscle cell, okay? So we're now into the smooth muscle cell. Now, what we've actually got is an en enzyme called soluble guanylyl cyclase. So you can see the abbreviations coming up on the screen. Soluble guanylyl cyclase is an enzyme which converts or increases the rate of reaction of guanosine triphosphate into the second messenger cyclic guanosine monophosphate. So that's soluble guanylyl cyclase increasing the rate of reaction from guanosine triphosphate into cyclic guanosine monophosphate, which is a second messenger. Now, the effect of this reaction here is to reduce the amount of calcium within the uh, uh, smooth muscle cell. The way that it does that is it prevents any um, calcium being released by the endoplasmic reticulum of the smooth muscle uh, or sarcoplasmic reticulum and it prevents, uh, so it prevents any being released and it also allows the calcium to be uptaken back into storage again. So you're basically getting rid of the calcium within uh, the smooth muscle cell. Now we know that calcium is extremely important for uh, actin and myosin crossbridge formation. formation. Uh, so if you get rid of calcium, you're not going to get muscle contraction. You also get a reduction in myosin light chain kinase activity. So MLCK refers to myosin light chain kinase and that is uh, reduced. The activity of that is reduced. You cannot get the actin and myosin crossbridge formation and then you get relaxation of the smooth muscle cells and you get vasodilation and you have an increase in, in um, blood flow. So that, my viewers, um, is the way that you have vasodilata vasodilatation occurring uh, via the production of nitric oxide, uh, the act it activity of nitric oxide on the smooth muscle cell um, and the relaxation of that smooth muscle cell as well. So hopefully you've uh, enjoyed this kind of brief uh, insight into how our blood vessels dilate. Uh, please uh, stick with the video tutorials and I hope to see you again very soon.